a kind of knee-high or slightly larger dogs, and most of them were that. They were a mix of adults and puppies of different ages, and there was actually one set of fetal mandibles, so apparently there was one pregnant dog. Um, these were not special dogs in any way, they seemed to just be street dogs, and a lot of them had broken bones. Uh, one of them was old enough to have a very arthritic back, um, but no indication that these were special. On the other hand, it was pretty clear from the age distribution, this is not what's called urban die-off of dogs. This isn't the natural age distribution you get in dogs who die in cities that you know, don't have any owners, that sort of thing. <coughs> They were, for the most part, adults. There were less puppies than expected, even though there were a fair number of puppies. And so that suggested there was something sort of unusual going on with this, and that the dogs and babies may be linked in some way. And hopefully I'll persuade you of that. Mm -hmm. um, the animal bone was mixed in with a lot of human bone, and here's a, a photo taken by Lisa Little of um, some of the unmixed material, which you're seeing there's a whole lot of dog bone, but infant remains as well. Um, I mentioned John Lawrence Angel. He looked at this material uh, briefly and included it in his article, Skeletal Material in Attica. Attica. He published this image of the scapulae. It's not actually all of them, but those are the ones he had pulled out of the mix. And until our work, this was the only published image of the material from this. As you can see, his assumption was that they might have died simultaneously. Um, it had first been suggested, or he suggested, oh, maybe this is associated with Sulla's sack of Athens, but in fact the date is very wrong. Um, and nobody had looked at the pottery yet again. Susan Rotroff's work showed us that this was not an, a simultaneous deposition. It's over about a 15-year period. Um, uh, in dealing with this mass of infant bones, it was a little daunting, but the first thing you do is count them. And so I sorted them all out, rights and lefts and so forth, and found the MNI, the minimum number of individuals, is 457 <laughs> neonates and fetuses. Um, so a tremendous number of infants. There are smaller numbers of all the other long bones, but essentially when the bone gets smaller, there are fewer of them. Um, and of course, 1930s recovery, um, you would not expect perfect recovery of all the bones, so smaller things did get lost a bit more often. Um, for a long time, we've said you can't, can't estimate the sex of juveniles, but there has been recent work, or actually going back to about 1980, that has found that, in fact, while older children, we can't tell whether they're male or female, in infants and fetuses, we can. And that's because, of course, during the, the prenatal period, you've got the hormones that, you know, distinguish males from females, and these affect the skeleton. And so it turns out there are methods that can be used. Um, and so some years ago, I went through all of the, the ilia. It's the little, the, when you stand like this with hands on your hips, your hands are on your ilia. So it's the, the big bone of the pelvis. Um, and evaluated uh, the sex. And you can see um, with the right, I had slightly more ma uh, males. And on the left, I had slightly more females. But statistically, this doesn't differ really from 50-50. So there was no evidence of sex selection. I was always a little uncomfortable with this because I had never tested myself on known infant skeletons, which are you know, fortunately rare. Uh, but in fact, starting this fall, I worked on the Bass Collection at the University of Tennessee and tested myself on sexing all of the infants in that collection. And then right after the AIA meetings, I stayed and went to the Smithsonian for two days and was able to go through um, a portion of their collection of infants and found that, in fact, I am correctly sexing infants, um, which was a relief. I have to say I've done about 170 individuals so far, so a pretty good test. So I can now fairly confidently say that there's no sex selection going on here. It's roughly 50-50, which is what we would expect, in fact, with natural infant mortality. This is not killing infant females. Um, or something like that. Um, the Eretria excavations um, I began to work with in 2016. Uh, they were excavating a well uh, from the Swiss school, and it's associated with the gymnasium. It's a Hellenistic gymnasium, and this part was actually dug by the American school in the 19th century, and then the Swiss have dug this half, and it's a somewhat unusual sort of double gymnasium. 
has a little bath complex right here, and the well is here. And they got so far down at the well, they first found some pieces of bronze. I will show you it's a partial above life size Togate male bronze statue. Um, who is my best friend, of course, because once that was found, they really needed to dig the rest of the well. Um, below that, they didn't find more bronze statue. That's very interesting art right there, for example. What they found was a lot of bones. Um, just below the, the bronze statue pieces, they found a lot of adult and child bones. And then they got a little bit below that and started finding infant and, through all of this, a lot of animal bones. So you can see the, the levels here. Now one big difference is the water table is all the way down here in this well, and there's no evidence that it's ever been really much higher. So unlike the Agarok, where the bones stayed underwater pretty much forever, um, so constant environmental conditions, here you've got the water coming through cracks in the rock, but these things are not staying saturated all the time. So they've probably dried out at times and been wet and so the preservation is not as wonderful. Um, on the other hand, it was 100% water sieved because it was 2015, not 1937. Um, and so we've got near complete recovery. All of the water sieved residue was sorted um, and they did meticulous recovery. There were things like tiny little finger bones that were only two millimeters long and they were capturing those. So. Um, some of, some of my work on the earlier Agua Ra well, I had wondered, is this real or is it an artifact of recovery and preservation? Preservation's good, but you know, I don't know so much about the recovery. Um, here I'm pretty confident I've got it all. On the other hand, the preservation's not so great and there are a whole lot more broken bones. So, um, but it's been interesting. Um, this well has masses of animal bones, a much higher percentage of animal bone than we had in Eretria. Um, and in some levels, this is one fairly far down, so early on into baby levels, but this is the animal bone from the level, and those are the infant bones. So, you know, the percentage is pretty low. Um, as you get up into periods when it seems like they were using this most heavily for infants, you know, one of five orange bins will be infant bone. So, but it's definitely a whole lot more animal bone. There are, a, it, and it has not been studied yet. Um, I know, from going through it myself, because I've sorted it all, there's a tremendous amount of dog bone again. So very interesting, but there's also a lot of butchering debris, and especially a lot of the sort of primary butchering debris where they're cutting off feet and they're you know, cutting off heads and the, the parts that don't have a lot of meat on them are in there. Um, there's also a lot of bird bone, and so, you know, it's a variety of things, but a lot of large butchered animals. Um, as I said, the, the well does not have uh, quite as good preservation. At this point, my counts of individuals, so this is a work in progress, are based primarily on whole bones that I could measure. Um, and here you've got at one level the five whole femora, and then all the femora that are in pieces, some of which I'm hoping to be able to rejoin, um, but some of those I may not be able to. So. Um, these are um, somewhat unusual piece of bones called the petrous portion. It's the, what houses the organs of hearing and balance in your ear. And as the name suggests, it's rock hard. It's the hardest, densest bone in your body. Um, they preserve very well, and fortunately you can estimate age fairly well from those also. Um, here you see from, from one level, what I've got is a, a, these five individuals I could pair up, and that's been one of the joys with this, is I could actually pair match, because that's going to allow me to estimate better how many people are actually there. And then these are all the singletons, down to the actual youngest individual in this. That's a roughly 18-week fetus. So very, very young fetus. Um, lots and lots of dog bone. Uh, they're old dogs with worn teeth. They're young dogs with pretty unworn teeth. There are, once again, fetal bones, those are little petrous portions from puppies. Um, or so I was told. Um, but again, all the bins just look like these masses of, of dog remains, or animal remains. In addition at Eretria, there's another well that was dug uh, in 1997. Um, the, it was not screened and not all of the bone was kept, so it was sort of hand collection, but not screening. 
it has large numbers of dogs again that have been studied and um, 19 infant femora um, from one side. Uh, so a minimum number of individuals of 19. So a smaller number. Um, it's in the vicinity of the Sebastian, but again, after the well is abandoned, it's being used for disposal of infant bodies and dogs. Um, and I think some butchering debris, but what I've only seen are the dog bones and the, the infants. So, there's a thing going on here, but trying to figure out what's going on is interesting. When I look at the age distributions of these three wells, first of all, the Sebaste on here, um, it's only 19 individuals. So, there may be some noise there. With the Agara, I get a peak that looks like this, which is... Um, full-term infants, and Eretria really surprised me when I got this flatter curve. Um, this is a textbook example of how not to do a PowerPoint slide. I'll tell you right now, bad, small print, too many broad lines. But the point of this is, we've got a lot of comparative material in the world. And what I want to do is unpack this a little bit for you, but that's a whole lot of sites with a lot of infant depth. First of all, this cluster that all have this peak. It's here around 38 to 40 weeks, which is a full-term pregnancy. Pre most pregnancies go to full-term. That is when you're most likely to be born. It's also when you're most likely to die. Even today, your greatest risk of death at any point in your life is at birth. Um, and so we expect deaths around the period of birth. Um, and then you have some preterm infants. What you've got here, the agora, is the broad, the broad blue line. The two green lines are a North American group called the Arikara. The Arikara were Plains Indians, and you've got their, their pre-European contact line here and the post-European contact line there a bit lower. The Arikara, both from their own traditions and what was observed by outsiders uh, through European contact, always tried to raise their infants. You know, if a parent, parents couldn't raise them or the parents died, somebody else kept those babies alive if possible. As a result, they are a good model for natural infant mortality. It was not infanticide. There was not exposure. They are not abandoning babies. These are the ones they couldn't keep alive. And so it probably is as close as we can get to a really good model for natural infant mortality. And you'll see the Agara curve goes along with that as well. This golden line is Crisa Borbu's work at Messini. Uh, there's a well full of infants, and this is the age distribution she's found there. The two dotted lines, and I'll bold face them here, um, <clears throat> the red one is from Ashkelon, this is a Smith and Kahila study that argues that they have infanticide, large scale infanticide in Ashkelon. Uh, the other one is Simon May's work at Hamilton Roman Villa, where he also argues this line is infanticide. And the only reason they argue this, they say, well, if you're going to kill a baby, you're going to kill it when it's first born. So this peak here must be infanticide. The problem is that peak there is when you're most likely to die. And when we look at the rest of the Mediterranean and the New World, we see this same distribution. So. I must admit, I don't buy it, and yet Ashkelon in particular is cited over and over and over again as definitive evidence of large-scale infanticide in the ancient world. Um, and I just don't think it's so, because the mortality curve is exactly what I've got at the Agora, um, and now I'm going to show you how I think those babies died rather than infanticide. We'll get there. Now, um, in contrast, there are more, not exactly flat, but missing that peak around 38 to 40 weeks, a number of different sites. Warham Percy is a medieval church cemetery, which in fact Simon Mays contrasts with the Hamilton Roman Villa. He argues this is natural, is um, normal infant mortality and the peak is infanticide. The problem is this is a medieval church. Children had to be baptized in order to be buried in the cemetery. And in order to be baptized, you have to be alive. Now, there are plenty of tales saying that parents who were you know, very distressed about their child being excluded from the sacred ground would you know, essentially bribe a priest to say, oh, I think there might be some sign of life and baptize the baby quickly. 
But the reality is, I think this is infant mortality missing the actual stillbirths or parents whose children die who can't afford to have the child buried in that cemetery as well. The Kellis II site from Egypt also is an early Christian site. Now, I don't, it's not clear whether baptism was a requirement, but it's interesting that you're also missing that. I must admit, after I measured the Eretria babies and, you know, dumped it into an Excel spreadsheet and, you know, told it to tell me how old these babies are and graph it, I about fell out of my chair when I saw this, because honestly, I was expecting exactly that peak that I got at the Agora and, and everyone else gets with natural infant mortality. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. <laughs> it's late Roman. It's actually a Christian community. Or, as I mentioned, my numbers right now are based on the whole individuals I can measure. And this may be sampling error. So again, this is work in progress. Um, I'm a little surprised by this, I must admit. I'm not quite sure what's happening here. Um, this long tail actually is coming out here to that 18-week <coughs> Venus, um, which is about the youngest I have ever heard of anywhere from an archaeological site. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about what's going on here. This is something I'm going to be thinking about for a while. But there they are. So why do I think these are natural deaths, not infanticide? Um, first of all, this dotted line is, is what we call preterm birth. Being born prematurely today raises your risk of death dramatically. Of course, in the ancient world, it would have done so even more. Even if the baby's lungs are developed well enough, premature babies are born without that layer of body fat that makes them, you know, cute little things that you want to cuddle. Premature babies are kind of skinny looking. Without that body fat, they do not thermoregulate well. Um, infants have trouble maintaining body temperature anyway, but without that body fat, they get too cold when it's cold, as it is in Athens sometimes, you may have noticed, and they get too hot when it's hot, as you may have noticed also happens in Athens. Um, so just that can kill infants. Added to the fact that in the period when this well was being used, the sort of standard medical advice, and we get this from Hippocrates, and I think it's in Soranus and various other medical writers, the medical advice was when an infant is born, you should not let them nurse in the first few days when the mother is producing a milk that's called colostrum. It doesn't look like the normal milk. So it must be bad for the baby. You must not give them the colostrum. We now know, of course, that that's just chock full of antibodies and all sorts of things you need to get your digestive system going. Instead, you're supposed to give them hydromel, a mixture of honey and water. And of course, honey, we now know you should not give to young children because it's often just chock full of botulism. Um, so the worst possible thing just about that you could give a newborn infant was what you were supposed to give them and it would probably create diarrhea in a lot of them, and diarrhea fills an infant within 24 hours frequently. So you're getting a lot of deaths um, around birth, but if you add to the problem being too small, and then the fact that premature birth is often triggered by problems. You know, there's some intrinsic problem that, that led to this. So I think a lot of them are dying just because they're too young. But there is good evidence for pathologies. In the Agora wells, I found a lot of endocranial bones, and um, layers of new bone on the inside of the skull. Most often in the occipital, and this is where it shows up clinically as well in the modern world, but other bones like the sphenoid and the frontal bone, here you can really <coughs> see it's actually delaminating a bit. You can see that separate layer of bone. In the yeah, modern world, um, particularly in the third world, one of the major causes of death in infants is um, bacterial meningitis. And it's bacteria introduced from cutting the umbilical cord or <coughs> putting something on the umbilical cord that is not sanitary. And it's a tremendous problem. It causes new bone formation, most often in the occipital, but it can happen in the rest of the skull. And it develops really very quickly. So I think some of these infants are dying from uh, bacterial meningitis. Of course, there was no sense of sanitation or germ theory or anything like that. Um, 
when I got to Eretria and started looking at the bones, the bones are much more fragmentary, but once again, I'm seeing these layers of new kind of bubbly looking bone. Oops, that's a semi -steon. Even here on the petrous portion, notice this petrous portion, how different it looks from the normal one. And then in the semi there's relatively little cranial bone, but lo and behold, some of the fragments have this as well. Um, there are also developmental defects uh, in the skeletons. Um, these can be caused by genetic mutations or syndromes, maternal nutritional deficiencies, environmental teratogens, including alcohol, um, and even sometimes just poor position of the fetus in the womb. If there's pressure on a developing limb bud, sometimes it just doesn't develop. Um, cleft palate is the most common <coughs> skeletal de de birth defect. And um, in the Agora, I found seven lefts and two rights in the <coughs> collection. Uh, what I did was, this is a normal, complete palette, and I took every single one that wasn't normal and complete, and went up to the conservation lab and looked at it under the microscope, and took the ones that had grown that way as opposed to breaking. And under magnification, you can tell that. Um, at first, I was a little bemused by this seven, but I, again, small sample, I thought it might be random. Turns out, actually, left side clefts are much more common than right side clefts. In the developing fetus, the left side generally lags behind the right in development by just a little bit. And if, when those regulatory genes switch off and they say, we're done growing palate bone now, sometimes that palate is incomplete more often on the left. So this may not, this may be real, not, not accidental. Interestingly, at Eretria, a much smaller sample. I've only got 23 myxilla. Um, but there are three clefts among them, and none of them are on the left. They're only in the right. But that may be sampling error there. From the Agora, there's a congenital limb defect, dysmalia. Um, first bone I found was this ulna, and again, this may not look all that great to you, but if you look at it, this is a 26-week fetus. This is a roughly full term infant. This bone is very thick. It's very broad and yet quite short. And there are some malformations of the joint surface as well up here at the elbow joint. Um, I went back through everything else again, looking for thick, short bones, <coughs> and found this humerus. Again, 26-week fetus, full term, and this strange, thick, broad one. Um, so it looks like there's some developmental problem with this. The most common <coughs> limb defect um, is what is called absent radius syndrome. In fact, the radius bone, you've got two bones here in your lower arm, the radius and ulna, and the radius fails to develop at all. And so you have instead a single forearm, or a single upper arm bone and a single forearm bone. Sometimes it's relatively normal with a relatively normal hand. Other times you get a reduction in the number of uh, raise of the hand as well. But this would be instantly visible at birth. So in fact, if there's some exposure going on, this would be a child who's a candidate for exposure if, if this limb uh, was deformed in that way. There are also a few older infants, um, two about six months old, one about 18 months old, that were in the well. And in one of them, um, as I was kind of reconstructing the skull, it's like, this is a really big skull for this really thin bone. And in fact, the skull is about the size of a four-year-old child. And yet, in associating other bones simply because this is the next to largest child in the well, and so, you know, sort of, here's the number two set, obviously older than newborn, um, the dental age is about six months. So, very large skull. One of the markers of hydrocephalus, where you've got cerebral spinal fluid blowing, uh, expanding brain, and this is from 1922, before there, we had shunts that we um, control this with. There was what was called setting sun sign. And if you notice this child's pupil and iris only rises partway above the lower lid, and it's because the pressure in the brain is pushed down into the eye orbit so that the eyeball is depressed. And lo and behold, I've only got the, the left orbit here, but in fact, instead of being at roughly a 90 degree angle, this one is depressed downward very strongly. Um, in addition, the, the fontanelles, the soft spots, are wide open the way they would be in a newborn or even larger. 
and yet by six months they should be largely if not completely closed. So all sorts of things in this suggest this child had hydrocephalus. So what you've got here is a child who probably had some sort of neurological <laughs> defect, sometimes associated with uh, neural tube uh, formation problems, building up spinal, um, cerebrospinal <coughs> fluid, increasingly debilitated, and a little scary looking as this head gets bigger, but in fact was cared for very carefully. Keeping this child alive for six months in ancient Athens was, was almost a miracle. So there's some real evidence of care here. There's some real evidence of not care, sadly, as well. The oldest child in the well is a victim of child abuse and multiple occurrences. This is what we would call a battered child today. There's a cranial fracture here on the back of the skull that was actively healing at death. Um, the limb bones, and again here, it's, it's an 18-month-old child. It's the oldest child. It was the most mature cranial bone. So I was able to pull out this much of the skeleton. Um, you've got essentially bone bruising. And when you irritate bone surfaces, the periosteal membrane, the membrane that surrounds the bone, will start <coughs> laying down new bone. Um, in a fracture, it's part of the fracture process, but it also happens in bruising. And a real problem with abused children today is caretakers will, you know, either hold them too roughly or actually twist the limbs. This is a fairly common thing. And one thing that shows up in abused children today is what's called a corner fracture, where the lower arm has been twisted to the point that it breaks the humerus. And there's no healing on this, but it, I think it's perimortem, not postmortem. I can't guarantee that. There were also what appeared to be healed rib fractures against 18-month-old child, so it's been alive for a while. I got a radiograph of the, all the ribs, and in fact, these two ribs are the ones where I could see that, you know, what looked like a healed fracture. But I got a friend of mine to, who's an orthopedic surgeon to look at these and said, you know, are those rib fractures? And he said, yes, there's one here, there's one here. And there's one here. So in fact, there's a third one that I couldn't see. Again, in child abuse, squeezing a child's chest is fairly common, and you can get fractures. Now, fractured ribs occasionally happen in birth trauma as well, but they're very common in abuse. And so I would testify in court that this was an abused child. So we've got sort of, in the older ones, the whole range of care and abuse. Now. Um, what else is going on? Um, midwives attended many births um, in both the Greek and Roman period. Most of the images we have are of Roman midwives. Um, but it was a real profession available to women. Um, they were proud of it. They had it on their tombstones. And so we get these fairly graphic images of childbirth. Um, midwives intervening in difficult births sometimes leave marks. This is a radius and ulna that I think are probably a pair. I'm not 100% sure, but they're found in the same fairly narrow lens uh, from Eretria. And you've got a bunch of this bruising again that I'm talking about, this new bone formation. But this is on essentially a newborn or a child who lived just a few days longer. Um, and again, in a difficult birth when you're putting traction on limbs, it's possible that happened. Otherwise, a newborn infant isn't likely to, to have this sort of damage. Um, there are also fractures from both the agora and eretria. There's a complete femur fracture um, from eretria. And the femur in an infant is you know, less hard to break than an adult, but still, it's somewhat unusual. And obviously, newborns are not walking around. They're not doing things that would break their legs. From the agora, there's both an ulna, so a lower arm bone, and the fibula, which is the smaller of the lower leg bones, that have green stick fractures, partial fractures. Um, and I was, you know, never sure what's going on here. And then I get to Eretria and find more fractured limbs and such. So I think these may actually be manipulations by midwives again, um, because they are perimortem fractures that look very different from the broken bones that are postmortem and taponomic. And then there's this one. And this is the grim low point of this lecture, I will say. Um, these are cut marks on a femur, up here at the head, near the hip joint, and further down. This is almost certainly an embryotomy, the attempt to dismember a fetus 
in order to deliver it. Um, there are a lot of ancient accounts of this. Again, Sarinus, um, the Hippocratic corpus. Um, it, it's a problem, particularly if you've got a, a fetus who has a malpresentation and one limb is delivered, literally sticking out of the birth canal, and the child's stuck, and they die, and the only way to save the mother is cut up the end. And this femur presentation is fairly common in a breech birth, so coming rear end first, not head first, and one leg um, protrudes. And so there's actually one other archaeological case of this that has been identified as well. Um, so multiple cut marks trying to, to extract that leg. So, looking at causes of death, is this emphaticide, is it natural? Roughly 30% of the Agara individuals have this evidence of cranial infection. The cranial bone is so fragmentary from a retria that it's going to take a whole lot more time for me to get a count of how many bones I have that have this, but it's definitely there in some quantity. Roughly 15% at the Agara were preterm, and a retria of the ones I've measured, almost 40% of them are preterm births. Um, developmental defects, birth injury. Overall, roughly 50% of the infants, I can account for something that contributed to or caused death. In your general village cemetery, if I could tell you how 50% of the people died, I'd be the most brilliant paleopathologist on the planet. Um, most people die of things that leave no evidence. So the fact that we have this much evidence suggests this is the range of natural reasons infants die with a few human interventions as well, abuse and, but, and rough deaths, which you could either attribute to the, a rough birth, sorry, to the midwife, but it's, that's part of the process, that's part of why infants die. So, we still have this problem of why are there babies in wells? Um, you know, why are there babies in wells? Infants were cherished, they show up in funerary monuments like this, you know, they, they do show up in, in graves, often in slightly more well-to-do graves, but you also find little pots with infants and so forth. Why are there babies in wells? And we're back to the midwives again. More images of midwives. In the Agara well, we have this little miniature herm, and notice that's a five centimeter scale, so this is very much a miniature herm. Um, Andy Stewart studied this and spent quite a while trying to identify it and finally found that the hairstyle and the drapery fits Beth with Elethlea, the goddess of childbirth. So the herm is actually broken on the base, um, so you know we don't know why it got there. But if there were a goddess that midwives were to honor, it would probably be Elethlea. Um, it's certainly tied into childbirth in some way. Midwives, we know we're supposed to clean up after the births. And various references, including Socrates, whose mother was a midwife, and he uses midwifery to talk about giving birth to ideas, and in that drops quite a few hints about how midwives function. They have to carry away the afterbirth, the placenta. So every birth would produce, you know, a couple of pounds or kilos of, um, maybe eight kilos, of tissue that you got to do something with. So midwives would need a place to dispose of biological waste. We also know that they were involved in uh, <coughs> postpartum care, as well as around the birth, up to a ceremony called the amphidromia. And it's not unlikely that they might be asked to dispose of the bodies of infants who died right at the time of death. <coughs> It's unlikely mothers had a lot of agency in this. It would be the head of household who makes this determination that you know, we're not going to bury this child. What about the dog bones? What's going on there? I kept talking about dog bones. All three of these wells are full of dog bones. Dog sacrifices are unusual, but not impossible. Hecate had dogs sacrificed to her. And Hecate, of course, if you Google Hecate, you can find all sorts of strange websites. But Hecate was a goddess of transitions, of liminal states, particularly into and out of death. And of course, perinatal birth 
would, would have both of those, but she is a childbirth goddess. But in addition, dogs were sacrificed to remove ritual pollution. That sense of, of um, you know, you, you've acquired something that is impure. Two things that cause ritual pollution, not the only two, but two important ones, are childbirth and untimely death. And so here again, if you've got an infant who dies, you've got both of those things going on. So we, in publishing the Agarab Bonewell, suggested that these dog sacrifices are in fact being made by the midwives to remove the pollution to which they've been exposed in this process. And Hecate is possible, and I could find images of Hecate, um, but I suspect the midwives and the ritual pollution may be the answer. But it's very clear that infants in wells go together with dogs in wells, and they're not natural urban die-off of dogs. They seem to be sacrificed. Finally, there's this amphidromia, of which these are not images. The amphidromia was one of those household family things. There are no images of it, as far as I can tell. Here's Dionysus carrying um, Hermes. Sorry, Hermes carrying Dionysus. Um, and this is an infant being presented to Artemis. But what I wanted was images of babies being carried around and presented. The amphidromia, again, fairly private. We don't have a whole lot of sources. There's actually an article called Sources for the Amphidromia, um, which lists them all. Um, it was a rite of passage in which a child is formally incorporated into the family. The anthropologists would say they've acquired a social persona. They've been made human. It's possible that infants who die before the amphidromia would not be buried. That potentially is expensive, there's some effort involved, and if you've got a midwife who's carrying away a placenta anyway, again, is involved up to the amphidromia, because the, amphidromia, the midwife took part in the ceremony. Um, it would not be unlikely for them to be asked to dispose of the bodies. Um, the last bit of data, and I won't show you any more data charts, but um, I gave the measurements for the Agora um, to an anthropologist, a demographer, named Lyle Konigsberg, who deals with statistics in the way we all went into archaeology and classics, so we didn't have to. Um, but Lyle um, was very interested in modeling natural infant mortality and looking for populations that looked like the Arikara as well. So I gave him my data. He did much more nuanced age estimations than I can do and came back and said, yes, absolutely. This looks like natural infant mortality. But what's really weird is they're all dead by about day eight. And I said, let me tell you about the amphidromia. Because I did not. I just said, I think this is natural infant mortality. Again, it, it, they're different references, but about the seventh or eighth day seems to be most common. Occasionally, it's, it's combined with the naming ceremony on the tent. But interestingly, those babies in the well, except for those special cases, one, the hydrocephalus and the abused child, are all dead before they reach the amphidromia. So I think that's what we've got here with the agora, and I expect that's what we've got in Eretria. But as I say, the, the measurements kind of threw me for a loop, and it's always fun when your data don't come out the way you thought they'd be. So, Anyway, as always, there are many, many people to thank. First of all, my Bonewell colleagues, Susan Rotroff and Lynn Snyder and I, uh, they're actually standing in the well. <laughs> um, and of course, John Camp at the, the Agora, the Swiss School, uh, the American School, and so forth. So thank you very much. <laughs> now, uh, you know, and I, 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 I forgot I told you that. The adults in the Eretria well, bizarrely, have leprosy. And I'm working on a site in Thebes that is full of leprosy, and my worlds collide. And I must admit, that slide I pulled out because it was getting too long, so I forgot that. So, yes, the, there's something else weird going on in those adult buttons at the top of the Eretria well. But, Questions, comments? Yes. But I found this very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, just a comment. Um, in Eretria, I think there are two wells, three. It's a rough situation. Well, there are two in Eretria, yeah. they're full of babies, and then one at the Agora in Athens. Uh -huh.
the, at the Athenian Agora, and then there's one in Messini, okay. way down in Peloponnese. So. so in Eritrea there are two, mm -hmm. right? Uh, isn't there a central at the end? There is, yes, and they were working on that this summer. It's down there near the harbor, um, but yes, uh, that's something I want to sit down and chat with them about, because there, there is, and they've re-excavated this summer and found a whole lot more mm -hmm. growth last summer. And then just another question, uh, have you, is it possible to identify the Not as much, but you can find, dogs have a penis bone, which is pretty much a guarantee it's a male. Yeah. And there were a lot of penis bones in the Agara collection, but not as many as there were dogs. So it is a mix of sexes, but um, from the bones themselves, it's, or Lynn was not able to, to estimate that. The so. question is related to Oh, oh, okay. We do so I, I've been looking uh, like quite uh, obsessively about uh, um, uh, searching for data of dog sacrifice, puppy sacrifice, and I, I've seen that there is um, uh, many, many deities, healing deities, female healing deities, most of them dealing with birth and rebirth, from Mesopotamia dealing with Bula uh, to the Gauls, who are offered puppies. Oh, that's very interesting. And as far as, as uh, I've seen, they are uh, offered very often bitches. When oh, okay. the gender is specified, uh -huh. they talk about bitches. Right. And that's why I yeah. asked. They're definitely both, because again, there were those female <coughs> remains, yeah. females, and not enough penal bones to, to accommodate all the dogs. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you very You're much. very welcome. Yes. Uh, is it an accident that you found those bones in an Agora well, or was the Agora place specifically dedicated to such uh, um, From what we I know could be about annoying the here for PowerPoint. The location, I think, for the Agora is simply that this had become kind of an abandoned cul-de-sac. Um, I mean, there, there were these bronze workshops here and this series of, of cisterns. Those are abandoned. The buildings kind of fall down. By the time the babies are going in there, you've got this, which may be the arsenal, which probably had, you know, sort of a blank wall here. You've got the Stoa of Zeus here with a blank back wall. This is a cliff. I mean, it's not unclimbable, but it's, it's not the way you would easily get there. To get there, you have to come in from back here. So what I imagine this is one of those kind of abandoned, vacant lot urban spaces. <coughs> Other things grew up around it. There's a well. Nobody's using it. You know, when all ancient wells are used for trash pits. Why, why waste a good hole in the ground? Um, but this one's kind of invisible, and yet it's also right here in the center of town. And you think about midwives and the habit babies have of coming and keeping people up all night long. And they're dragging home before dawn, and they've got to dispose of this. And here's this convenient well that nobody can really see. Um, so I think, yes, the location is important, but not deliberate in terms of the, the construction of the Agora. The other interesting thing is, and I'll get to both of you in just a second, both this well and the well at Eretria, in the top of the deposit, suddenly there are a bunch of boulders big boulders. And that's unusual in wells. You want to keep filling them up with garbage as long as you can. And both of them look like somebody said, uh-uh, we're stopping this. Because they're great big boulders. In either case, were they weighed or measured? Even in the Eretria ones, they had to break them up to get them out. And so I don't have weights. But they were significant rocks that they had a hard time getting out. So I, I think in both cases it may have been discovered and then stopped. <laughs> but again, that's pure speculation on my part. Can I come in really quickly at this yeah. point to point out that this is technically not in the Agora? Well, yeah, it's, it's not in the form. It, it is, is in the Agora excavation. It's, it's in the Agora excavation. But it would not have been in the public space right. that ancient Greeks would have known as the Agora. And I think that's quite significant for yeah. the way you want to understand Because again, it's isolated. It's isolated. It's used, right. But it is in an area where we know that in the classical homes, there are houses. So that fits with your 
observation of babies coming at awkward times yes. and midwives <laughs> needing right. to get home and just right. wanting to dump it somewhere. Yes, yeah. yes. This would not have been all the babies who died in Athens in that 15 no. period. It's not all that many no. over 15 years. So, but yeah. I, and again, I imagine a whole lot of placentas went into this well as also. But of course, there's no evidence of those. And they didn't, it looks like, finish digging it might have. Yes, it got unstable, but they had gotten into that fine sediment that's right at the bottom of a well. Oh, so they were close to the Yeah, they were close to the bottom, but it got so unstable they stopped. Um, but they'd also stopped finding any bones yeah. almost a meter higher yeah, than I that. that. So I, you know, pretty confident we got it all. Is there any evidence for maternal death in childbirth? Um, a little bit. Um, finding. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> finding um, infant remains actually still in C2 undelivered are pretty rare, but weirdly in the new excavations in the Agora a couple of years ago in one of the Bronze Age chamber tombs they've just recently dug, there in fact was a collection of fetal bones in the pelvic area of a, a female. Um, the rich Athenian lady who was cremated has a fetus <coughs> with her about a 36-week fetus, I believe. But, you know, we can't tell whether it was born and they both died or what. It's mixed up. So it's it's actually fairly rare. And a woman who just dies in childbirth, you probably wouldn't be able to tell from the pelvis, you know, certainly from any other rough birth, difficult birth. Um, but if they die immediately, the bone doesn't have time to react to that trauma. So you're probably not going to see it. Hi, that was great. Um, Maria, um, the one question I have is that if there was, or if we're looking for kind of statistics for extensive kind of female infanticide, how would those charts of yours look different? I mean, the one that, that is actually as important is that when you were able to right. sex them, it does seem to be roughly 50, yeah, 50 yeah. which seems to be an argument, which would seem to be a very strong argument against it. But I was wondering, in terms of the age, would, would, the, would you expect then, if there were extensive uh, female infanticide, you'd expect those charts to look different from the age? Mm, well, it depends. I mean, if it's only infanticide versus infanticide combined with the natural right. deaths, yeah. um, I would expect more of a peak, I guess, mm -hmm. more birth, more deaths around birth because mm -hmm. the ones that should have survived you're also killing. I see. So I expect you get a, a steeper, but uh, you know, there, there's some variation anyway. I mean like the Arikara, Arikara yeah, uh, pre-contact <coughs> were a pretty healthy, well-fed population. Mm -hmm. Europeans come and kill all the buffalo and try mm -hmm. to starve them to death mm -hmm. and the death rates change mm -hmm. and you get a slightly lower yeah. peak there. Um, but yes, that's, that's a good question, but I, I think you'd expect a more exaggerated peak um, if you had the natural deaths as well. Plus a differentiation, presumably, by sex. Yes, yes, and, look, and, and nobody has looked at the sex of these infants in these populations um, prior to this, because it's still just getting, a lot of people didn't believe it worked and weren't applying it, and I wasn't sure it worked, but I really needed to know this, so I was pretty happy. That in fact I was correctly sexed. I'm not all of them. I was getting about 85, 87 percent correct. But you know, even in a, a adults over 90, and you're pretty happy about that. So it, it wasn't bad. And probably more importantly, I was missexing <coughs> roughly equal about numbers of males and females. But I wasn't consistently calling males females or females males. I was missing both directions. So I'm. I'm Again, as confident as I can be, that's correct. Do yes? Are there many graves of infants in the other world? There's some. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a lot of them in pots. There are others. If they aren't potted, they may not have been recovered, or these, you know, the bones may not have survived. So they're probably more than we have. They don't cremate children. Do they Yes, yes, there is one cremated infant from the, the newer excavations. Um, they didn't keep all the cremated bone from a lot of the early excavations, so there may be more. Um, but there is one from, from that north bank of the Eridna Cemetery that, that was a cremated infant. So we don't have, there's not so many infants. No, no. 
And, and pretty much all worldwide, there are never as many babies in the cemeteries as we know die. This is, this is the natural infant mortality that's usually <coughs> visible. And that's what's so unusual is we're getting, you know, for a short period of time, we're seeing the reality um, that most of the time just vanishes. If they're burying them casually under the floors of houses, unless you're really sieving carefully, that kind of thing, you're not catching them. Um, or they're burying, or some cultures don't bury babies. You put them out in trees or, you know, just all sorts of different things. They get treated differentially, and so you don't capture them. And here, you put them in wells. And here you put them in wells, yes. Uh, and and part of what I want to argue is that there may be, again, we didn't used to save animal bone, and the difference between chicken bones and baby bones is not great. Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect there may be other wells that have been dug that have had a whole lot of babies in them, but they just haven't been saved. And now that we're saving mm -hmm. all the bone that's coming out of wells, I sort of expect we'll see more. And there are four or five other wells in the Agarot that have baby bones in them, just not in huge quantities. Mm. Um, so I, I bet there are more out there. We've just begun to capture them, though. Yes? Uh, do you think that uh, this uh, choice of wells uh, could be a sort of metaphorical substitute womb for babies, just as in another way, but just like the, all the, 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 the pots they are buried in, uh, I think I'd expect a little more ritual, more evidence of more going on than pretty much convenient disposal. And again, the pottery is big enough to hold bodies in. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that sense of pollution that, you know, it's like, yeah, I think we'll just throw away this basin, so go on and take it. Um, there's just no. You don't get a sense of any great care, ritual, anything like that. I honestly think it's exhausted midwives who just need to dispose of another sad death. Um, but then why this this uh, this this dog? Uh, because well, it, well, well the what? sense of pollution, and and again, they're common dogs. And if you go walk around the Agra today, dogs start following you. And if you're carrying something that smells like it might have been food. They're going to be following you, and if you want to kill a dog, you literally could just grab it and, I hope, slit their throat. So, and here, I, every time I get to uh, talk about this now, somewhere out there, years ago, I saw an image in a, a red figure, you know, it was a little close-up, so I don't even know what the shape of the face was. It's a woman standing at one of those marble well-held heads, and she's holding a puppy which she clear a live puppy very clearly that she's dropping into the well. I don't know. I wasn't working on this when I saw it. I'm just such an animal lover. I was horrified, and I remember it. It's out there somewhere, and somebody's going to say, "I know where that face is." <laughs> I don't want to hear from you, please. It's the only image I've ever seen of that, but it is very clearly a live puppy being held over one of those well heads. Um, so, and I would really like to find that face. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about the last thing, I know I used to work in Lavrion, and there were cases, modern cases, of people, mostly hunters, trying to dispose of their living dogs by throwing them inside the, the mining shaft. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, uh, so it's the easiest way, I imagine, right. to dispose of <laughs> an the animal or, dog, puppy, yes. or another animal. I but what that. I wanted to ask is, like, it's clear, more or less clear, that the Agora well is, up, is on the verges of... Uh, on the, on the outskirts of the world of the living, of the um, former world. But in Eretria, I'm not sure if this is true, because Sebastian was used in the Roman period. It was right. a, an important building. And I think the gymnasium was not abandoned. I think it had yet. been abandoned by the time this garbage is going in okay. it. And it, you know, the, the city sort of shrunk down toward the sea. And that's one of the things we're still sort of talking about. I suspect if butchers are using it for disposal, um, that it's kind of out of the edge of the living space by now. Um, and it is the, just the vast majority of that bone's animal bone. Um, and again, lots and lots of foot bones and things like that. And the Sebastian is kind of next to an uh, industrial area. Yeah. We know that. Yeah. Is that the day of the Eretria burial is late? It is late, yes. <laughs> yes, I, somewhere I had that third. Yeah, the city definitely shrinks after. Yeah. 
-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and there's a Roman bath with hypocaust and such built further down that probably was more appealing than those Greek basins. And so so it, it looks like, I suspect it was pretty much abandoned again. Again, because it's being used for all this butchering debris, which of course doesn't smell good. And attracts lots of flies and that kind of thing. So you want that away. Yes. Do you remember the location of the well in Messini, where it is in connection to the um, gymnasium or the mausoleum? I don't, and I've never gone to the well. I've mm -hmm. been to Messini. I seem to always get to Messini mm -hmm. about sunset. Where and I, I joked about some yeah. year I've got to go there and start in the morning. Um, but And I want to talk to Krisa again about this, because now I've found another one, and we need to get together and think about babies and wells a bit more. <laughs> there, is, there is a possibility that there is an Eletheia sanctuary in Messini. Yes. Oh, interesting. Still okay. not in the city, though. Okay. Outside, yeah, outside on, on, the mountain. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think I've known where it, uh, I'm sure I've known where it is, but I can't come up with it right now, because honestly I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Certainly. Yes. <clears throat> So on the issue of the Hippocratic advice versus what is probably much more beneficial, it, it, um, you can't really assume that they all actually no, do that. No, do that. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and yeah. The, yeah. it could be that even midwives yeah. were more practical, and yeah. often maybe there wasn't even a midwife, they were just yeah. members yeah. of the yeah. family. Yeah. Right. So it could be that, in this case, the medical yeah. advice yeah. would be better. What would hope? Not, <laughs> not really yes. Advice. Definitely be better off with that because um, there's, there's just almost nothing worse that you can give a baby than unpasteurized honey and water. <laughs> um, but human beings do some amazingly stupid things sometimes. <laughs> In order to make space for the refreshment, please, when you stand up and fold your chair. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.